everyone. Welcome to Joyce's World. I've been performing Rachmaninoff's music quite a bit, especially his piano concertos. After performances, uh, when I have a chance to speak with my audience members, uh, they usually ask me, how do your hands move so fast? How do you play so fast? And we don't have much time, so often I say, you know, you have to practice a lot, start really slow, and get fast little by little, and it takes a really long time. And I was never really able to get into actually responding what it takes to get ready for a very virtuosic passage. So today, I wanted to go over that with you. Rachmaninoff Rhapsody on a Theme by Paganini is one of my favorite pieces. It takes a theme from Paganini Caprice for violin solo and it transforms it 24 different ways into different variations. In the 23rd uh, variation, right at the end of it, so we're reaching the most exciting um, parts of the Rhapsody, the orchestra suddenly drops out and I find myself alone on the piano and every ear and every eye um, from the audience and in the orchestra um, focused on me and it's a very exciting little bit that goes something like this. orchestra comes in sort of responding to my energy and we go toward um, the very uh, climactic ending of uh, the Rachmaninoff concerto that everyone seems to love so much but this this passage you just heard um, is really difficult for a number of reasons uh, one uh, you are so exhausted in a way by this point in the piece and um, when you're feeling all this momentum from the orchestra, when they suddenly drop out, it's really hard to focus uh, on performing this hard passage really well all by yourself without that momentum and energy um, from the orchestra. It's, it's as if you were riding this magic carpet and suddenly the carpet just disappears. And there you are in mid space by yourself. And really, you either have to soar or um, there's a, a good chance I might crash and burn. So I have to get this uh, moment really uh, ready before I go on stage. So Rachmaninoff was a pianist. He was a great pianist and he could um, perform all of his concertos. And we really um, look up to his music and his uh, renditions of his piano concertos. And he writes very well for the piano. This passage is actually a bit um, easier than what one might uh, think. He uses this sort of um, uh, composer technique, if you can call it, or trick that maybe no one um, other than the piano circle wants to know about called split octaves, where instead of two hands playing the octaves together, split so that the right hand plays immediately after the left hand. So when this is um, brought up to the final speed, it sounds like this. Instead of, if you play together, I think you'd agree when they're split, it sounds much faster, almost twice as fast. So let's focus on this little passage, this sort of uh, soaring into the, the top of the piano. So how do I get ready for a passage such as this? First, I guess like everybody, I would uh, listen to see if this is a kind of piece, kind of uh, composition that, um, that moves me. So I would first go and listen to all these great pianists, different renditions of it. I think that's what I did when I first came across it when I was about um, 15 years old. And then uh, when you're looking at a passage like this, it's important to understand what's going on. Um, I never sight read very well. I learned by ear uh, the first two years of my uh, music education. So um, it 
it's always a struggle for me to uh, try to read music without knowing um, what's going on. So still today, I would look at the score and figure out sort of um, figure out the blueprint of what is going on. When I look at this, there are 14 different notes. That's 14 and that's the end mark. So it's going from a note before E flat, going all the way up to um, high E flat. So in these 14 notes um, that are split and just going up like, I like to think like a Chihuly glass sculpture. Um, what is going on? Let's look closer. For me, I divide these 14 notes into four groups. The first group is, is a chromatic. Second group is a diminished triad. Third group, also a diminished triad. And then we have a little tail. And then we have reached our destination. So for me, it's easier to understand and remember a long passage like this when I split it, and then I would really think of what it looks like in my head before diving in to um, really practicing it. Next, I look at the score and look at all the indications that Rachmaninoff gave me. He writes piano, crescendo to fortissimo in this edition. Different editions might have different um, dynamics, but let's go with this one. Going from piano to fortissimo over um, the span of 14 notes, I have to make the decision whether to make the crescendo um, sort of in a smooth line, each note being a little bit louder than the one before, or to be extra dramatic, um, I've been experimenting with keeping the line quite soft so piano for the first four, five to eight different notes, and then suddenly um, putting on the gas pedal, uh, so to speak, and getting to fortissimo very, very quickly in a very short um, amount of time. It's sort of like keeping the excitement and suddenly surging forward. And to me, sometimes that brings a much more brilliant ending to this little passage. Um, so I would um, experiment different ways, what works best and what, what image you're going for. But most importantly, we are doing exactly what Rachmaninoff um, told us to do. Um, and as messengers of his music, let's really try to honor piano going up crescendo into fortissimo. The next thing to consider, I think to make this passage seem um, very fast, and very dramatic and exciting for um, the audience, which really is the, the function of this mini cadenza before we, we get to a very um, climactic finish, uh, is voicing your fingers so that the audience hears what they're supposed to hear. I think um, a lot of the times performers are like uh, guides when you go sightseeing something, you know, we're everyone's looking around and they could miss whatever that is really important uh, in that spot because it goes by so quickly or um, you just uh, paid attention to something else uh, in the meantime. But as performers, uh, I think we need to bring out exactly what the audience needs to hear and pay attention to it so when the moment hits, everyone is listening really to the same part of the piece and you're getting your message across. So, one thing you should know is that as pianists, thumbs are, um, make rude, rude sounds sometimes. They're short, they're stubby, and when you don't control them, they send, tend to be a bit louder than your other fingers. Um, and in this, this passage, you're only dealing with thumbs and pinkies when you play octaves. And what you want to bring out is the extraordinary, um, sparkly, brilliant um, upper register of the piano just going from darkness to light. So what you want to focus on is your pinky. So make sure um, when you're learning this, the top is really heard above the bottom. 
instead of if you bring out the bottom it sounds a little bit stubby a little bit heavier and what we want is this effervescent um, moment of sheer um, energy and momentum toward the top and we don't want anything heavy um, pulling us down so this is the voicing that I would really work on next uh, finally we're down to making this passage happen now there's no trick to uh, to practicing it and uh, shaving time off it it's you have to be very patient and I think this is the part where people really um, don't enjoy but I think if you had the steps of discovering what's going on added your dynamics thought about what the composer wants and then thought about your voicing then it's like all the tough work um, is out and all you have to do is really make your body uh, get to know it and um, for you to feel very comfortable with it for it to become a part of you so when it's time to play something like this you consider it like you know ripping off a band-aid and it becomes really fun when you have um, nothing to worry about but to get to that point um, I'll tell you exactly what I do in order to get ready for a place like this. Um, even though I think of it in four sections um, of 14 notes, because I'm going to have metronome going, and metronomes can only go um, in a steady pace, uh, I will put four notes or eight notes, because they're really um, in a split um, format. I'll put those per beat at 50. This is the metronome I use. It's very basic. Um, it's an app called Metro Timer on my phone. So we'll put it at 50, which I think is plenty slow enough. It has to be ridiculously slow when you're first working on it. wasn't so great. I went faster than the metronome. Let's try again. After that, I will take it two clicks higher. two clicks higher you see what I'm doing um, the important thing is to stay with the metronome not like my first time through and when it sounds bad when you feel like it's losing control or it's going against the dynamics the voicing um, all these goals that you're going for you have to get back to a slower speed and just two clicks in a row sometimes one um, when it's not going so well and I'll bring it up to uh, Almost concert tempo, I would say about 80%. At 80%, I think um, I would feel pretty secure about hitting the right notes if I did the metronomic work all the way from um, very, very slow up till 80% performance tempo. So I like to practice in context from that point on, add what comes before and after, and record myself. Uh, sometimes it's painful to hear and watch myself play because I just only hear all my errors and faults and it's definitely um, glass half empty when I hear myself play but um, I have to go through this process to uh, really discover what I'm doing wrong, what can be improved and those things are sometimes very hard to hear when you're the one performing so you really must listen as an audience member and you you'll be your greatest critic so when I hear myself play um, sometimes I have problem in the middle of this passage so in the in the beginning I have this there's almost no chance that I'm gonna miss that but what comes after is a bit tricky uh, and sometimes I uh, get flustered there which means um, the something coming after that is going to suffer from the shock from the middle so it's really hard to get to the E flat on top 
uh, feeling like a superhero. So I know that the middle passage is something I have to work on right before the concerts uh, and uh, just make sure it's in my system. So this can be done in one sweep and I have fun doing it. Another way I like to practice uh, when I get to 80% is really look at the passage from a different angle. Uh, for example, uh, I like to get to the very end of this passage, play it first, add a little bit to the end, add a little bit more, and then play the whole thing. This seems like a simple thing, but when you're used to only playing it from beginning to the end, uh, it's a totally different experience um, trying to remember what comes right before something and not going forward. It's almost like trying to say the alphabet backwards to see if you really know um, which letter goes where. So when I do this, um, it helps me in the concert because um, when there's an audience, big audience in front of you, um, somehow the piece feels different. Everything that was obvious before suddenly feels a little bit new and um, you're analyzing it in a different way when you have to deliver um, to the audience. And when you do this, I feel like it's, it's, it gives you a little bit more understanding in, into the passage, uh, making you feel a little bit more secure. So uh, there's uh, less to worry about. And that's the last thing you want to do. Um, on stage worry that something's going to go wrong. That could just kill the whole performance. So here are the ways I really try to get myself performance ready for those fast virtuosic passages, how to get my fingers ready, how to get my mind ready. Uh, and I hope this was helpful to you. And if you're a performer, um, this process of really repeating over and over at various tempi and thinking about it in different angles could seem tedious uh, because it's such a short passage and it actually just takes the span of maybe one to two seconds. Uh, but uh, I think once you uh, overcome the tediousness and um, really think about uh, this passage in many different ways and when you can deliver it in the concert and it fits in the context and I assure you a passage like this is um, really worth every second of um, working hard in the practice room. Uh, I think you'll feel a lot of joy really conquering something as complicated um, as this and it's such an important part of the concert so I think you'll really enjoy it when uh, the work process is finished. So thank you for listening and uh, see you next time on Joyce's World.